Welcome everyone. My name is Virginia and I'll be the facilitator for today. Um, and I'd like to welcome all those that are here and all of those that are on Zoom. And would you please uh, mute yourself if you are coming in on Zoom. And now I'd like to just make some brief announcements. First of all, I'd like to thank Bellin for her diligence in lining up speakers for the church. Uh, and also glad to announce that Taylor Swan will be appearing again next Sunday, the 23rd. Are there any other announcements? Just to say to continue to keep Sandra in, in her prayers is uh, she is still in the rehabilitation center and and is getting more tests. Which reminds me, we do have a prayer team here, the silent prayer team, so make sure you either call me, contact me, or leave a message in our prayer box of anyone you want listed on the prayer, on that prayer team. So, so May is power of the month is power, and I'm looking at this, well this doesn't seem right, we're talking about 12 powers, how come power doesn't have its own name? How come it doesn't have its own word? You know, we, we've talked about love, we talk about faith, we've talked about wisdom, we've had strength. So what's power? Um, now we did learn that the power is located in the base of the tongue. Well, I think that means words. Okay, what's the word for power? Um, in Proverbs 12:21. It says, the tongue has the power of life and death. So we're talking about power, we're talking about words, and we're talking about the tongue. Interesting. Maybe the word word is just too big to be named, too big to be talked about. Uh, how, do you, how do you describe word? Um, and in the Aramaic language, which is the language that Jesus spoke, um, and one of the, the scholars of the Aramaic language talks about word, and he said, word is the hardest word to translate from the Aramaic. It hasn't been done, so most of the scriptures just use the word word. And the reason is because it is so big and so vast, it is not able to be understood. So I brought with me uh, the book by Dale Hoffman, and he goes through to describe some of the translations and some of the meaning of the word word. I'm not going to read them all because there's so many, but I picked out a few. Word is awareness, outward flow, expansion, meaning, beginning through the end, the alpha through omega, manifestation, appearance, living law, consciousness creating, ex expression, intention, declaration, purpose, message, image, description. So maybe there's no word for word because it means so much. So why do we have one of, the, one of the spiritual powers we have is we have the power of the Word. Also in Scripture it says, in the beginning was the Word. And that meant creation. We have the spiritual power of co-creation. The I Am, which is the name for God, the I Am Principle. So whatever we say after I Am, we are creating. I think that's big, <laughs> real important. Be, be careful of your words. <laughs> The, uh, it's also the throat chakra. The base of the tongue is also the throat chakra. This is where we express who we are. This is who we, we express who we think we are. Uh, so our words are very powerful. Uh, there's a song that we have in Unity. It's called, Our Thoughts Are Prayers and We Are Always Praying. It has been said that we, we think about 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And eventually those thoughts are going to turn into words. <laughs> We will, eventually, we will eventually express what we really believe, what we really think. So we sure need to be watching our words as we're always affirming who we are and who we are. Is it, and are we saying, I am a beloved child of God? Or are we saying, I don't deserve this, I'm not worthy? 
Whatever we say I am, that's what we are creating. Now it is time. forever. These are the words of Jesus, and we're talking about the power of these words. This room has been filled with the vibration of this beautiful music, and it puts us in a very special place. So as we are already started into meditation, thinking about the presence of heaven. Jesus says, heaven is in you, heaven is in your heart, heaven is inside you. As you slowly breathe in and out, imagine that you are going deeper inside. Each time you breathe in, you find yourself going to that place, that special place where heaven dwells, where you dwell. And each time you take in a breath, the light gets a little brighter. You see more clearly where you are. You see more clearly where this place is, what it looks like, the reality of it. And as you look around, Notice what's there. Is it a room? Is it a bubble? Is it this very safe and sacred place? The place where you can be yourself. You can express who you are and you know who you are and you are totally accepted. There may be things around this place that you can look at that are symbols. What does this mean? What does this mean to me? What is this telling me about who I am? How I fit, where I belong? What my purpose is? And each time you breathe in, a little more light is shining. 
a little more clarity, a little more awareness that this is a real place. Heaven is within your heart. You may ask, Teacher Jesus, what is the meaning of some of these symbols? What is the meaning of these things in my sacred place? What is the word that you are giving us? What is the word you're giving me? I and the Father are one. You can come to this place anytime. It's always here. But as you leave, you are taking with you a special gift a special light, a special light that you will be able to share with everyone in this room, with everyone in the building, with everyone in the world that you live in, because you can always have the memory of being one. And as we come back, this morning being here in this place, in this building, um, I'm going to, I, uh, the message I'm bringing is about the word. Uh, and of course I brought my God bag because I always teach for my God bag. Something in here tells us about God. <laughs> I think I'm the kind of person who just always looks for, you know, what is this telling me about God? <laughs> what do I need to know? And it is a horse. Why a horse? Well, Luann told us the first, the first week, uh, the disciple that is uh, related to power was Philip, and Philip means horse. Okay, I will now give you all my knowledge about horses. <laughs> uh, first of all, horses are very powerful animals. We're talking about power. We measure power in horse power. <laughs> but how does one regulate this great power? What good is this power if it's not regulated? How do you, how do you harness 10, 1100 pounds of animal <laughs> so that you could ride it? Well, it's through the tongue. You have a harness and you have a bit, and the bit is on the tongue. So the tongue is the most sensitive part of, this, of a horse, and therefore this is how you can steer and regulate the horse. This is how we steer. Our mouth is steered and regulated. With that bit and with the harness, you can turn the horse's head to the right and they will go right. You can turn them to the left and they'll go left. Uh, if you want the horse to slow down or to stop, you pull back on the bit. One person, a small human being, can have total control of the horse, of the power of the horse. Uh, Proverbs 12:18 says, "Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing." Wow, the power of our words. So, the question I have to ask myself: We have to ask ourselves, who regulates the power of my words? <laughs> Another example of the horse is like, you know, if you know anything about race horses. You know, a, a racehorse is a successful horse because they love to run and they want to be first and they want to be out front. <laughs> That's, otherwise they wouldn't be a racehorse. But it's a jockey riding the racehorse. The jockey has a higher perspective. The jockey knows the plan. The plan is to win the race. And there's going to be times when that jockey knows if I let this horse run flat out, he's going to burn out, he'll lose his power, he will be over, eventually overtaken by the other horses. So the jockey uses his bit to hold that horse back, to slow him down, to pace him, and then wait to that right moment when, when, the, when the jockey knows, give him his head, that's the term, let him go, because we save the energy for the end. So again, do I trust the higher power when things don't go the way I want? They aren't moving as fast as I'd like? 
Or am I saying, it's divine timing? I will know when it's time and when it's not time to use my words. Sometimes new riders, when they're learning to ride a horse, if they aren't experienced with it, it's a little intimidating to be involved with this much power. And so what do we do? We pull back on the reins. Let's hold back. I don't, I'm not safe here. I don't feel comfortable. Am I ready to claim my spiritual power? Okay, am I ready to speak my, to speak my truth? There's a lot of times we're not sure we really trust that power. It's a little scary. Now sometimes horses aren't ridden by an individual. Sometimes they're used to pull a load or to pull a wagon, to pull, to pull a plow. And now they're usually put in pairs. So the thing about putting horses in pairs is they have to match. You can't have one strong horse and one weak horse. You can't pull it. You have to have horses that are matched in size and strength. They also have to be matched in pace. You can't have one horse trotting and one horse walking. <laughs> they both have to be going at the same pace. Uh, and it's interesting, of course, the horses are connected by the wagon, by the tongue of the wagon. So these horses are useful in pulling this weight only when they're under the direction of the driver. Probably the most, you know, ultimate example of a team of horses would be the Budweiser Clydesdales. I'm sure everybody has seen the Clydesdales if you watch the, if you, you know, you watch the advertisements, you know, on Super Bowl. But, and at first it's like, oh, that's neat. There's just all these, you know, beautiful horses and they're all marching together, pulling this big wagon. In detail, as you watch closer, we have just multiplied <laughs> the power of one horse times eight. There are four teams of two horses. And it's interesting about these horses is they look like they're all the same. They look perfectly matched. And of course, they spend five hours getting these horses ready before every performance, making sure the white socks and the feet are just beautifully white and clean. They're all groomed. They braid their manes and, and put on all of these pounds and pounds of tack and harnesses to make them look quite impressive. The first two horses in the team are the smallest and the quickest because they're the ones who help, they're the ones who have to travel the furthest to make the team turn. The next set of horses are a little bit bigger. Uh, they also don't have to move as fast, but they do move faster. Then there's the third set of horses. They're even bigger and stronger because they're taking more part of not so much turning, but pulling the load. And then the final set, the fourth set of horses, the wheel horses closest to the wagon are the biggest and the strongest because they're the ones who are pulling the most of the weight and they're the ones who stabilize the wagon. Keeps the wagon from tipping over when there's turns. So each horse, each set of horses has its place where it belongs. And there's one driver that holds all the reins for eight horses. One driver who's conducting this whole, this whole performance. Now these horses no longer deliver the Budweiser to the, to the warehouses. Uh, they are basically, they just travel around in performance. You know, they travel around in three huge, huge tractor trailers and to do their performances. They travel with seven handlers. <laughs> To these horses, and not to mention probably all the other crew that's involved. Uh, as I said, it takes them five hours to get the horses ready for a performance. It, and then after they are ready, it takes 40 minutes to tack them up. It takes 40 minutes to get them all hooked up and all the tack and the gear that they're that they are um, that they're wearing. And most of the time, you really don't. I've never really paid attention. They just look quite massive, and you're watching, you're watching the whole group of horses before me, but you don't notice all the details. There is a video showing these horses after a performance when they are being loaded back up onto the trailers. And these horses are standing there. You can tell by the people who are watching that it's summer because they're wearing very summer clothes. So here are these horses who have just done a performance. It's got to be hot, and they're probably tired. 
and they stand there so patiently for all this time because it takes about another 40 minutes to take all that tack off. And as you're watching, I just found that the, the choreography of watching what they were doing is, you know, you start with the first set of horses and you take off some stuff and you schlep it back to the, tra the trail, the tack trailer. And then they take some more stuff off and they schlep it back to the tack trailer. And these constant people running back and forth with all this tack. So finally, the first set of horses is freed and they're taken back to their trailer. Then they start with the second set and they're schlepping all the stuff back again trip after trip, you know, and it's all these, tri all these people know exactly what they're doing. It looks like a choreographed ballet, if you want to look at it that way, of putting away all of that tack. And meanwhile, they do mention that it takes about four hours afterwards to clean and polish all of that tack that they're wearing. But the fact that these horses stand there so patiently, so finally the last two horses, the, the ones who pulled the greatest load, finally get a chance to have all the tack off, go back to the trailer, have a drink of water, and have their supper. And this is done day after day as they do go around doing their performances. There's also a video out there of when there was an accident. There was an accident uh, at one of the performances. Apparently, it, when they were doing their figure of eight turns uh, in the middle of this big arena, something happened. There was a pileup of horses and a tangle of all kinds of equipment. Things were breaking. It was it was quite a it was as qu it was quite a scene. Uh, and of course, immediately all the the uh, the crew immediately is rushing out there, uh, you know, to untangle these horses from all this. And it's like they stood perfectly still. If there's a time for panic, and that many horses with that much power would have been quite a panic. <laughs> um, but they patiently went out there and they started untangling these horses. And it's kind of interesting, one of the first people out there uh, into the arena was, was one, of the, one, of, one of the handlers who was their day off. And so this person running out with shorts and sandals on, <laughs> you know, grabs the first, you know, is out there with the first set of horses to help untangle them, get them separated. There was one horse that was down, and that horse just laid there and did, nobody moved. The, I think the trust that there must have been there. But anyway, they stood there calmly until all the horses were freed, and they were all able to be led back. And I'm just impressed with the trust between the handlers and the horses and the driver. It's like, usually if you've ever seen an accident or one of these catastrophes, you notice how everybody's running around like a Chinese fire drill. These handlers just seemed to know what they were doing. It just was, they were just knew what to do. There was no confusion. They were just going here and there, taking care of everything, dragging off all the broken gear and, the, and all the torn straps and everything. And the horses were patiently, watching and I thought and it took less than 40 minutes <laughs> it's like it's almost like they've been through this before we've we've done this before there was this total trust yeah we're going to get on the tax going to be taken we're going to go back to the trailer and have a drink of water and have our supper <sighs> and I, I think for me uh, the lessons or my, my impression of this, the reason I, I'm sharing it, I thought what this means for unity, what this means for us is how power is multiplied when we can see ourselves working together. And being one doesn't mean all the same. It's important to serve who you are, where you are, where your place is, to know, to know what your gift is. And the amount of trust that's taking for this team of, of handlers and horses and drivers to be patiently waiting uh, is these small little, you know, a 2,000 pound horse is patiently waiting for this mere little humans to untangle them for this disaster or mess or whatever has taken place. Uh, and they sort of acted like it's just another, just like every other performance, I will trust that I will be taken care of. I will trust that this will work. I guess the thought that comes to my mind is the oneness, uh, the oneness and trust. What is the relationship between oneness and trust? Do we find oneness 
because we trust or do we trust because we find oneness? And so I think with that, I just would love to hear what other people have, have gotten or what insights other people might have from knowing about the power of the word and the symbol of the power, which is the horse. Thank you. And you talked about that horse, you know, wanting to win, and yes, but there is that higher, that something, that something with a higher plan, with a higher wisdom that was so meaningful. So I'm going to read a little bit what I wrote. In competing, competing to win, that focus hides something that there's something underneath that you know we um that that underneath competing is to experience something to experience um something far greater than what you think is possible perhaps and i call it experiencing the grandness of being all that you can be in this moment and the paradox is to be all that you can be in this moment you have to let go you have to let go of your training you have to let go of what your coach says you should be doing you have to let go of your past you have to let go of your mom and dad or your fans and just be in this moment to listen and in that point of connection there is a wordlessness there is an impulse there was just an understanding of where to go on this field at, at the right time to make the play that is your play. The play that has been calling, <laughs> the play that has been calling you. <laughs> and it touches me because this is, and we watch sports, we see this, and then we kind of cover it up. Oh, this is the winning team. But what we really want too as an audience is to be with our own grandness and um, to be with that, that something that takes a lot of trust because you have to let go of everything to be your grandness and in the grandness you let go of yourself you let go of your plan to a plan that's greater than yourself and that is the ultimate uh, grandness and in that grandness is a collaboration with you and something greater but that collaboration then gets expressed on the field with the team and the whole team collaborating together is is equally and amazingly grand and just the thought of right or wrong winning or losing i made a mistake he made a mistake takes you out of the game but to be in this moment and just be the channel to something far greater is the game. And then to take that game off the field and bring it into your life. So thank you so much. And I'm going very, to take very this. powerful because I'm an animal lover and I had no idea all the time and care and love it goes uh, toward, to, to getting the horses uh, trained and taken care of. Uh, when you said the mini um, power, in your mini power, you said the throat was a power, you know, is a powerful, uh, I realized when you said that uh, something to the effect of throat is the way to power and death or, or something like that, I didn't quite get it. But what came to my mind right away was that words, you can either give someone life by what you say or you can kill their spirit and cause some sort of uh, death in their spirit. It's a very powerful thing. So every word we say has great, great power. So that, I wanted to bring that up. And then the other thing real quick was, you said it also. I wrote down here, oneness equals love, equals trust and chaos and it's just was amazing thank you so much for sharing that as i'm listening to what's being said here um i'm reminded of some ideas that were written in various locations by doreen virtue um who is one of my favorite authors 
and she wrote a lot about angels and mythical things like unicorns and mermaids, things I like, fairies. And, um, but she was raised in the Unity Church and um, she had some interesting ideas and she also had a strong background in quantum physics. And one of her concepts was that if we make an error in our words or our deeds or our thoughts, um, that it could be undone. She believed that you could, because like in quantum physics and, and things, there's the idea that you can bend space and time. And so she would have a recitation that she would recommend that said that I undo all negative effects of my thoughts, words, and deeds in all directions in time and space. And I'll say that again. I undo the negative effects of any of my thoughts, words, or deeds in all directions in time and space. So that's a concept she had, she talked about, and I'm just sharing it because I like it. Um, it's comforting. Um, it's comforting to think that if you make a mistake, that it could be undone through the quantum through the bending of time and space. So if you pronounce that it's undone, then if you made a mistake with your words in particular, that you could start by pronouncing that or affirming that, you could start witnessing the manifestation of the undoing of the negative effects. So I'm just sharing that, and I, I'm done with that idea, but I, I like that idea. Th thank you. I, it's kind of like we can use the power of our words to correct where we made mistakes. The words still have power. <laughs> Good point. I heard you talking about power, whether it's the back of the throat making words or the horse. And quite often we find uh, these power things are potential power. And I heard you saying what the key is, is how we harness the power and the intelligence behind who the the, who's doing the harnessing. So uh, we have the potential of uh, being destructive with with the power or constructive. And I think that's where the key is, what I heard, what I, if that's what I heard you saying. Uh, Thank you, I hope I said that. It's like, who's in charge here? My, my personality or my Christ consciousness? <laughs> yeah, I, uh... I was moved by it too. I think that there, as I find my voice trembling here at the beginning of speaking, there is that sense of power and the camera's on and, and you don't want to make a mistake. But I found that when, like, kind of like what you were saying, Mark, when you're in the sweet spot, when you're in that spot, I don't, there is, there is a thing I have done, and it is to grab for something and mess it up. Okay, I did it wrong. But then there's this part of me that says, okay, we'll try again, and we'll just let it happen. And it's like you let some other power assist you, and you naturally meet that in perfect uh, unison that oneness. And I know that it happens in sports. I bet it happens in golf. I know that it happens in tennis. 
I know that it happens, you know, when you're when you're hitting the the ball or you're hitting the tennis ball with a racket. It's like there is a timing and you get in the flow. And I think when we're in the flow of love or passion for something we're creating or there's something about that passion in us that when it's coming from a loving place if we're acting out of pushing against or we're afraid or something like that the flow doesn't happen it's a way to learn what the flow doesn't feel like but I think when you're in the flow of it it is the most wonderful feeling you really feel connected to your higher power and I feel like it's that passion something about that positive uh, passion or expression and you see I'm talking a lot more clearly and smoothly now because I'm speaking with my passion and so there is a connection that we can have just one small thing I'd like to say uh, when when Pat, you were describing how the cor uh, horses were patiently waiting, they did not panic because they had the trust. And I think that's what we have to remember now, our time that we're living, because it seems like there's one chaos after another, after another going on. And I, I will, I will remember the horses as you described them being patient because they had the trust that it would be taken care of. So I, I forgot to mention that. Thank you. That we, the uh, untrained horses. <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you. Um, but yes, uh, I see uh, and teach that concept of uh, flow and team uh, and practicing and being patient uh, to my students as well and hopefully experience it as well uh, when I perform in a symphony. We have one conductor who has basically no power to produce sound and yet has all the power to, uh, to harness the, the talents of the uh, individual members and it's the individual members who put that trust in that conductor for you know the greater product of of the music making and it is that hopefully that state of flow that uh, that we try and hit where we're hitting not necessarily a competition to can I outplay my stand partner or am I playing up to my potential that I've practiced for but rather contributing again to uh, the the higher sense of of what the music is trying to say um, it is something that even my current teacher is uh, trying to get out of me so it's a never-ending process um, but I thank you um, about saying uh, Bell about the having the trust of when chaos is around you and you know as a musician we we trained for that and you know we sort of feel things are going a little bit not in as what we would have done in rehearsal um, and uh, we're able to do that but to actually have that same sort of trust in our day-to-day -day lives I think is a very important lesson that you hit upon so well so thank you Bell. I was just going to say that repeatedly it comes up in our conversation that we as individuals may be struggling with our power or, or be not as directed, not as fulfilled, and not as actually expressing the same degree of power. And it always comes back to joining that centeredness. And when we're in the flow, I think it's when we're most centered in our higher self or our God self or most connected to the whole and the choreographer of all life. And that's that's the connection we're after. That's probably one of the appeals we have in reaching for excellence in whatever we're doing is the joy of being in that space where the 
lower self or our ego self gets out of the way and that flow comes through us and expresses and we get to ride that joy. You know, we're, we're the instrument, but we get to experience that. And I really appreciate it. I'm a horse person, so I appreciated any reference to the horses. There's a, a lot of depth and many lessons that come from being with horses, just as there is with, with all animals. And I appreciate the reference for unity when we're looking at ourselves as a group and a representation of the church and how to work together for the flow. So thanks. surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is. I am divine. And so it is. And so now it's time for Dave to finish. <laughs> 